Welcome to the Social Purpose Exchange. I'm Sean Mallon. Here's a proposition that's turning the business world on its head. An obsession with delivering profit to shareholders above all other considerations isn't necessarily such a great business model anymore. Customers, communities, employees, and even some shareholders are now demanding that corporations do better, that they make a real and meaningful contribution to improving society. That's social purpose. And the Social Purpose Exchange is a forum for what we hope will be provocative, enlightening conversations about this concept that is revolutionizing the business world. Our guest for this episode is Kamran Niazi, who is a principal director at the international consulting firm Accenture. Welcome to the Social thank Purpose you for, Exchange. Thank you for having me. Good to see you. You've got a really fascinating life journey, born in Hong Kong, high school in Pakistan, university in Scotland and England, and then uh, for the better part of 20 years uh, living in Canada. Give you an idea about how that life experience has informed what you do now, particularly some of the other work you do away from the office, working with children. Absolutely, thank you, and that's a great question. Um, I think the, uh, the key thing to remember is that uh, you know, we all come from different backgrounds and we all have different experiences. Um, but that particular journey that I've been on has uh, really emboldened or really um, you know, given me the, uh, the true value and the true meaning of diversity and an appreciation of um, how humanity lives, uh, how it works, how it breathes, how it educates itself across different cultures, across different countries, across different dimensions of societies. And uh, that's really been the uh, sort of, you know, the, the, the genesis of, of, of me becoming me over the past 20 or 30 years. And in your work, you do a lot of consulting in terms of assisting uh, uh, firms dealing with their own workforce, particularly through yep. technological change. But you also do, in your private life with your wife, you do a lot of work, uh, especially with children, Children's Aid Society here, work back in, in Pakistan. What in that life experience has helped you with both your consulting work and your personal life journey? I think the key is, the key sort of impact that, uh, that life experiences had on my work has been really an appreciation of um, the purpose or the social purpose that we all need to have um, in our day-to-day -day lives. Uh, so let me give you an example. Um, everybody grows up you know, wanting to be a person X or a person Y when, they, uh, when, they're, when they're older. Uh, they want to be a journalist, a commercial pilot, uh, a police officer, whatever the case may be. But getting to a career objective and uh, building through uh, the, uh, the, the educational pathways that you need to to get there needs to be coupled with an appreciation of uh, what your role is in society. Uh, what is your overall objective? Uh, why are you here? And what kind of an impact can you make uh, to those around you as you embark on your own personal journey? So melding the two or molding the two together is the key. And I think as you get older, you get a little bit wiser. The more you know, the more you realize, the less you know. And uh, as a result, uh, that, uh, that informs you and that uh, helps to shape who you are and what you do and it reflects on the kind of work that you do both inside and outside the office. You, you lost your father when yes. you were a teenager. Did that have an impact on you, and particularly in terms of your focus on work with children? A massive impact, actually. Uh, so I went through the loss of a parent, uh, my father, as you said, in Hong Kong, and then uh, my family moved to Pakistan because we couldn't afford to live in Hong Kong. And as a result, uh, you know, we came face to face with poverty. We came to face to face with, or I came face to face with how um, a, a child needs to survive in a very tough um, environment and in a very unforgiving society. And so growing up, I had an appreciation for what children go through, uh, through grief, uh, because of grief and uh, because of a loss of a parent and because of, uh, you know, certain disadvantages that they may face in their lives. Uh, we went from a world uh, of being very privileged to a world of being very, uh, uh, you know, very unprivileged. And uh, we had to deal with that in our own way. And so that has given me a very good grounding in, in, in what children go through, uh, be they through the, uh, the, the children's aid system, so vulnerable children uh, through children's aid, or indeed children who, re who need to, just to be counseled, uh, just to be advised, just to be coached or mentored. And my wife and I do a lot of that uh, outside of work. In fact, you're pretty active 
foster parents. That's right. I, I have to credit my wife for that. I think I, I was definitely a little bit skeptical about the whole issue and the whole uh, challenge around uh, fostering and foster care, uh, but she had it within her and she said, uh, you know, this is something that we're definitely going to do. Uh, she's always wanted to adopt kids. We are adoptive parents as well. And we've been fortunate to find our lovely daughters, uh, two of them, uh, through the children's aid system in Ontario. So, um, you know, we've tried as much as we can to basically market uh, this cause, market and make people more aware of the need to be involved in children's lives and to make a difference in children's lives, uh, either on a personal level, uh, through your own work as foster parents or as adoptive parents, or through your money and supporting charities and supporting causes that, uh, that are out there, you know, trying to make a difference in people's lives, especially children. And I'd like you to speak about the, the school that you and your wife started in Pakistan. Tell me about that. Yeah, so uh, both my wife and I went through a, uh, a personal event uh, that unfortunately was a very um, sad part in our lives um, back in uh, around 10 years ago. And uh, we wanted to change that uh, negative event into a positive event. So uh, through uh, a charity called the Citizens Foundation, who I act as an advisor to, it's based in Pakistan, we built a primary school in my father's uh, village. So my late father um, was uh, a refugee from, from India who came to Pakistan uh, in, during the independence or the partition, depending on which political divide you sit on, uh, of 1947. And he's, his family settled in a village that was va being vacated by uh, Sikhs going the other way. So that village in the, uh, the outskirts of Lahore uh, in the Punjab province of Pakistan is where we built our school. Uh, there is nothing there now uh, from my family's perspective that connected us to that uh, particular village, except for a bunch of graves. Uh, and so now we have a reason to go. Uh, my, my children have a reason to go. Uh, the school houses about anywhere between 150 to 180 children, and it's fully managed from grades one to five uh, with a uh, fully trained teacher population that's uh, all female. Uh, so it's uh, all female faculty, uh, which uh, gives safe, meaningful employment to the women from the village and the surrounding areas. And the, uh, the student population is a 50-50 split between boys and girls. Uh, so it's, a, uh, it's very much a, a secular curriculum, but set within the context of, of Pakistan. How does this kind of work with children inform the work that you do in your corporate life, giving advice to business people and how they should conduct themselves? I think I'm very fortunate in, um, in having gone through what I've gone through um, and uh, experienced what I've experienced uh, and allowed that to sort of, you know, reflect on and inform me uh, when, it, uh, when it comes to my business life. And I'll give you a couple of examples. A lot of the work that we do at Accenture is around um, advising companies and advising organizations on, on the future of work and on the skills and the competencies and the quality traits that are required by leaders as they pivot their organizations and themselves to the new, as we like to call it. Um, and a lot of the, uh, the trends and a lot of the analysis and a lot of the research that uh, our firm is, uh, is, is uncovering points towards the need for executives and the need for managers um, and leaders to be more aware of what's going, around, what's going on around them. So the pursuit of profit or the pursuit of financial sort of, you know, operational, et cetera, metrics is not the be all and end all. Um, you know, corporate responsibility, uh, sustainability, uh, empathy, um, trust, you know, developing trust, uh, developing humility and inculcating humility and actually exhibiting uh, empathy towards your employees, towards your customers, towards your clients is key. That kind of stuff doesn't come naturally to a lot of people. And uh, I'm fortunate that I've gone through um, you know, a lot of the emotional sort of, you know, ups and downs that, uh, that, that, that allow you to build that kind of, uh, you know, that kind of quality and that kind of appreciation inside me. And I, I, I do want to touch more on Accenture's work, but yep. as a consultant, yes. does it give you more credibility with clients when you talk about these subjects and, and you bring up and Absolutely. my own private life? Absolutely. In other words, is it good for your business as a consultant uh, it, it to have this sideline? It's good for my brand, yes. yes. <laughs> it's good for my brand, both at a personal level and at a professional level. Um, I find I, I travel all over the world. I, uh, I work with clients in, uh, for example, the Caribbean. I work with clients in North America. I work with clients in the Middle East. Um, I work with clients in, uh, in, you know, in Africa, in, in Europe. And I'm instantly able to relate to them. Um, I can understand where they're coming from. I can understand what their customer challenges are, what their business challenges are within the context of, of, the, of the country or the geography that they're within. And I can have personal one-on-one -on -one conversations with them that uh, perhaps they wouldn't have with 
uh, other types of consultants uh, or even in their own management teams. And so it does instantly allow me to relate to them, to empathize with them, and for me to then uh, you know, really get to the heart of the problems or the challenges or the issues that they're facing, and then build through consensus some sort of a solution that you know, really speaks to the needs that they're uh, wanting to address. You mentioned uh, some of Accenture's work. They, they've done some pretty interesting research, which I'm, I'm going to quote. Sure. They did a survey saying 72% of CEOs say citizen trust will be critical to their competitives, competitiveness in the next five years. Also a survey, 61% of emerging leaders, which is uh, from the World Economic Forum's Young Global Leaders and Global Shapers, 61% say that business models should only be pursued if they generate profitable growth and improve societal outcomes at the same time. So that seems to indicate that CEOs and yeah. presumably the next generation of CEOs are getting it. They are, and, and it's changing with time, and it's changing with, um, with, with generations. So I'm glad you, you, you cited the, uh, the, uh, the Young Global Professional statistic, because what we're finding is that uh, most uh, individuals who are um, you know, entering the workforce are coming into the workforce with a very different notion of what perhaps you and I might think about as a job uh, you know what a, what a job should be or what I should be achieving for my career or what I should you know look for in an organization that I want to work for um, to give you some examples um, the whole notion of profit with purpose is is building a momentum and individuals entering the workforce indeed who are maybe five or ten years into their working careers uh, want to work for organizations and want to be part of organizations that connect them uh, to their personal lives and so it's not just enough about having a career at consulting firm X or public sector employer Y, it's about what kinds of products and services do they deliver and how do they have an impact on people's lives, right? Um, it's not just about human-centered design, what's it in it for me, but it's about what's in it for society. Am I, meaning, am I making a meaningful contribution to um, you know, society at large? Uh, the political causes or the social causes or the environmental causes that I'm concerned about or that I'm part of that um, you know, impassion me. Are they being looked after? Are they being addressed by the employer that I'm working with, or by the products that I buy from the companies that I uh, that I give my money to, or the services that I buy to the you know from the companies that I give my money to? So it's a melding of all of these sort of concepts, and it's an integration of people's personal um, you know personal objectives and their personal lives with uh, what they see increasingly at work and who they work for and why they work for them. Another uh, bit of information in that same report bolsters the cause. It yep. examined more than 2,500 publicly listed companies between 2015 and 2018, and it found that companies that combine high levels of innovation on one hand and sustainability and trust yes. on the other outperform their industry peers with 3.1% higher operating profits and greater returns to shareholders. That's right. So it makes a difference. It does. It's, it's not just for the good of the world, it, it does. does help the profitability. It's good for business. Um, so having a singular focus on profitability is not enough for the CEO anymore. Um, sure, there's other metrics and there's other you know, operational targets that you can set, but most business leaders are, are waking up to the fact that you, know, you have to build stakeholder trust. Your reputation, your brand, is, uh, is, 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 has to be protected and has to be developed and has to be grown um, in a very sustainable and in a very responsible way. And even technology innovation, it has to, be, has to be embedded and it has to be part of the fabric of your culture, of your organization, because you can't get away from the impacts of, of, of different types of technology disruptions, d despite you know, whatever industry you're in. But you have to do that in a, in a very responsible manner. So the impact of technology on people's jobs, on their roles, on their livelihoods, on what they do and who they do that for, is something that CEOs, executives, leaders all over the world in every type of organization, small, medium, or large, are having to think through. And if you can make that connection, if you can show that empathy, and if you can be that leader that you know, draws upon those softer skills to make that connection with their employees and with their customers and with their clients, people reward that with loyalty. They reward that with staying and working for you longer, and they reward that by spending more money on your products and services. And in fact, this is your particular area of expertise, isn't it? Dealing with technological change and, That's right, and yeah. the human issues, to which there's another bit of information uh, from that same report. Uh, the risk of leaving people behind in the workplace. Yes. I guess getting replaced by a robot or a That's computer. Right. That's right. It 
It said in that same report, investment in emerging technologies doubled between 2017 and 2019, but only 18% of organizations plan to significantly increase spending to reskill their people in the next three years. So it sounds like there's a lot more work to do in, in terms to, of lessening the blow. Absolutely, and this is why I'm in business, right? This is what keeps me employed. Um, the impact of technology or investments in technology and the impact of um, investments in um, artificial intelligence, uh, robotics, just to give you a couple of examples, and how the processes and the activities and the tasks that have traditionally been performed by humans change as a result of these new technologies is where organizations are really struggling. Um, everybody understands what they need to perhaps, you know, uh, you know, use AI for or to use robotics for. Uh, perhaps they have a very good understanding of the experiences that will be delivered by using more technology in, the, you know, in their organization, both for their customers and their employees. But very few organizations have an understanding of what does it mean for my employee population, for my, you know, my junior, my mid, my senior level, uh, you know, folks, and, uh, and, and what needs to change? How can I help them? Uh, does it mean reskilling? Does it mean a redistribution of roles? Does it mean um, a, a redefinition of jobs? Uh, perhaps we might need new jobs, uh, uh, new roles in the organization that we might need to recruit for. Um, how does this actually work? What do I need to do today to equip myself and my organization for success in the future, keeping in mind all of this work around and all of this awareness and consciousness around uh, the social enterprise and uh, profit with purpose. How do they work their way through this? If we can bring in a machine yep. that's going to do the work of 10 people yep. and the, the traditional attitude of the cold-hearted boss is, I've got this machine that doesn't ask for a raise or, yes. or bathroom breaks. That's right. Bye-bye uh, to five people. Sure. What, what's the new way of thinking? How do you work around that? Because this is all part of social purpose, isn't it? Absolutely. So, so you know, I'm not going to pretend to say that there aren't going to be potential job losses as a result of the transformation that the organizations, uh, indeed economies and cultures are going through. Uh, there will be. There will be a displacement of individuals who have perhaps done a traditionally, um, you know, what we would might call administrative, less skilled, more menial kind of, kind of activities and tasks. Uh, but that doesn't mean that people can't, you know, in reinvent themselves and uh, they can't, uh, you know, reskill themselves to use their right brain a little bit more, as we like to say. Uh, indeed, CEOs, as a, another Accenture piece of research, cites CEOs and, and senior leaders now need to be using whole brain thinking, uh, not just the hard skills, the quantitative skills and the financial skills that they've traditionally been asked to. Uh, uh, to sort of exercise when they're managing corporations, et cetera, but also the soft skills. Understanding, and this trickles all the way down through the organization, uh, understanding how to manage conflict, for example, um, being more empathetic, um, using insights and spreading knowledge and asking for help sometimes as well. Uh, so really understanding the impact of technology, but understanding the human side of that really plays a role in all organizations across all levels. And as a worker who might be, or as an employee who might be thinking, oh, I'm going to get disrupted, I might become unemployed, think about how you might want to reinvent yourself. What are those new technologies? What are those new skills that you might need? Whether it's in analytics, whether it's in um, you know, uh, different types of uh, you know, theories of change and uh, managing through change, uh, or whether it's through, you know, how, do you, how do I manage through a transformation? How do I help an organization or how do I play a part in an organization's transformation uh, that really does you know, help um, you know, me go forward and help my organization go forward? So it keeps me from being unemployed. It really does make a difference though, right? in terms of you need a happy workforce. Yes, right, absolutely. And if they think that robot X is coming in or new computer program Y is gonna come in, they're not necessarily going, you still need to, they still need, you still need the human factor to deliver absolutely. and you need to be sensitive absolutely. to that. Yes? Absolutely, absolutely. And this is where organizational culture has a massive, massive role, or the ability to be able to shape your organizational culture has a massive role to play, right? So leaders and, and, and managers and indeed uh, people who are responsible for other people, whether it's from a day-to-day -day perspective or from a strategic you know, uh, perspective, it doesn't matter what kind of role you play there's still a human connection that needs to be established and that needs to be made. Last time I checked, 
and the buildings around us, there's still people employed, all right? Robots aren't doing everything yet. <laughs> Let's hope so. <laughs> yes, indeed. At so, least not doing interviews or consulting. Exactly, exactly. So as long as there are people employed in organizations and in the buildings still you know, maintain uh, some level of population inside them that looks like humans, um, you know, we're not going to go away with the need to be able to empathize, with the need to be able to develop relationships, with the need to be able to um, you know, sell, deliver, uh, indeed become consumers or become you know, uh, uh, sellers of products to consumers without the need for a human touch, uh, without the need to be somewhat uh, attuned to the fact that humans have needs, human have, humans have wants and desires, and we need to be able to shape our organizational culture, the purpose with which we conduct business, and the products and the services that we sell and deliver, keeping that in mind. Okay, great talk to you. Thank you very much Thank for having you. me. Kamran Niazi. And that's the Social Purpose Exchange. I'm Sean Mallon. Thanks for watching. This uh, program also exists as a podcast, and I encourage you to find it wherever you get your podcasts. We'll see you next time.